Well, good morning, Christ Chapel. Great to see you all this morning. My name is Matt. I'm the West Campus Pastor. I'm delighted to be with you guys this morning, and we're live at the West Campus. This is going to be great. I've been looking forward to this for like a year, I think, since the last time we got together and I got to preach live here. So really excited to be with you this morning. We're going to be in Psalm 122 this morning. If you want to go ahead and grab your Bibles, if you don't have one, There's a blue Bible in the seat in front of you, and it's in page 517 in that particular Bible. Psalm 122 will be our text this morning, and I really love uh, that last song we just sang, one of my favorite hymns, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. I think I really want that. I asked Drew to make that the song before the sermon today because I really want that to be the prayer for our time today as we enter into the scriptures, as we talk about God's Uh, intentions for us because I think it's really appropriate for us as we think about why we gather together every single Sunday. Why do we come to church? We come together, we gather together to make sure our hearts are in tune with the Lord. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. That's the picture that I want us to see this morning as we do that. And I know that Not all of us have a musical background, and so I thought it's kind of an opening illustration. We could ask Drew to come back out here and help us understand a little bit more what it means to tune things. So I'm going to ask Drew and Olivia to come right back out here. Guys, this is Drew. Doesn't he do a good job leading us in worship? We're grateful for you, Drew. Thank you for doing that. So so we're not all very musical, and we understand you work really hard to make sure we have a great musical experience here when we're worshiping and singing to the Lord. Mm-hmm. What's the first thing that you do when you come and you set up and you start to, before you start your rehearsal? Well, besides take it out of the case, I tune it. Okay, well, why is tuning so important? Well, because if I don't tune it, church, it sounds like this. Yeah, that doesn't sound good. Nobody wants to hear that. Okay, so, <laughs> okay, so tell us a little bit about what does it mean to tune something? Yeah, so uh, we have a standard um, in which uh, each one of these strings is tuned to a note. And so I plug into a tuner and I tune the strings up to whatever that note is. Okay, so can you show us, maybe Olivia, if you could play a note for us and show us what that sounds like to be out of tune and then in tune? Yeah, so Olivia's gonna be the standard here. So we're gonna tune the A string to the A. Okay, let's hear the D. Back to the A real quick. And then hopefully it should sound a little better. Much better. So I guess when Robert Robertson wrote the words, the lyrics to the hymn, come thou found of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy praise. This is the picture he had in mind. I think he did. Very good. Thank you, Drew. I appreciate it. Thanks, Olivia. Yeah. Tell him thank you. Yeah. So our hearts are all a little bit like the strings of Drew's guitar. We desperately want to make good music, but just like the song says, we're prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. And we wander out of tune. We want to make good notes, but a lot of times it just kind of doesn't come out that way. We need to be tuned, but we can't tune ourselves. We need a standard that we can be tuned to. We have to put ourselves in a position where we can be tuned because I'm not the standard. And so as we gather around God's word today, I want us to understand what it looks like, how we can do it. What does it look like to tune our hearts to match the Lord's. We've been studying the Psalms of Ascent these past several weeks in our series as we prepare our hearts for Christmas. We want to prepare him room in our hearts. And these songs were songs that the nation of Israel would sing as they came up from Galilee, as they came up from the coast. They made their way to Jerusalem. These were series of songs that they would sing along their journey. And then once they got to the temple, they would even sing them as they went up into the temple itself. This song that we're going to see today, Psalm 122, is unique because unlike most of the Psalms of Ascent, um, it's focused on the place of worship and how worship takes place rather than the worshiper 
himself or herself. So the question I want you to see here, or the thing I want you to see this morning is that how does a psalm that, as you'll see, is about Jerusalem, this psalm is about the holy city, the city of God, Jerusalem, how does a psalm about the city of Jerusalem teach us something about how we can tune our hearts to sing about God's grace in our lives and why that is so important. And I think that the reality is is that God has been tuning the hearts of his people for centuries. He's always been tuning our hearts and the primary way that God does that is by gathering his people together for worship, okay? That's our idea this morning. When we gather together to worship God, it tunes our hearts. When we gather together to worship God, it tunes our hearts. Sunday mornings are like a tuning fork for our hearts. You know, we go out in the week and we're out in a world that's, that's, that's teaching us and tuning us to all different types of realities and truths. And when we come back here, we get that standard and we, we turn, our, turn our, the dials of our hearts and the knobs of our hearts to match exactly who God is and what he has called us to be. So, I think Psalm 122 shows us four ways that worship changes our hearts and tunes our hearts to God. And you have those in your notes. We won't have any screens this morning, so I'll try to make sure that those are clear for you when the blanks come up on the screen. But let's first read the text itself, Psalm 122. A song of ascents of David. I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Ah, Jerusalem, built as a city that is bound firmly together, to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord. There thrones for judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. These are the very words of God. So, how does gathered worship tune our hearts to sing about his grace? Let's look. The first thing I want to show you this morning is that when we celebrate God's provision, it tunes our hearts. When we celebrate God's provision, it tunes our hearts. Notice David's first reaction to the news that it's time to go to the house of the Lord. I was glad. Now, in the English translation of the Hebrew, it's a little bit of an understatement. We don't really use the word glad anymore, especially when we would probably say, my heart leapt for joy, or I was excited, or pumped, or stoked. And like that's, that's how we would say this. I was really excited to go to the house of the Lord. In fact, I'm sure it was the same for you guys. You know, when I wake up my kids for, for church in the morning, I, I, I rouse them from their slumber, and, and I say, Children, it's time to go unto church. And they say, oh, my dearest father, I am so glad. <laughs> That's how it went for you guys too. Okay, cool. We've got something in common. That's great. <laughs> we laugh at that um, because, to be honest, a lot of times it's not just our kids that feel that way, that aren't that excited about going to church. Sometimes our hearts aren't that excited about gathering together for worship. I mean, sure, we're up for going. We don't mind it. But excited? Pumped? Stoked? Were you stoked for church this morning? Meh. Maybe. When we aren't glad or excited about gathering together for worshiping Jesus, that should tell us something about where our hearts are tuned, shouldn't it? What excites us is a great indicator of what our hearts are most in tune with. You see, celebrating God's provision, the reason we celebrate God's provision is because it reminds us what to be glad about. It, it, it reminds our hearts what should be most important in our lives, what we should be excited about. For the nation of Israel, the feasts that they would come to Jerusalem to celebrate those were celebrations because they were opportunities to joyfully remember everything that God had done in their lives, his goodness, his faithfulness, and his power to provide. 
The nation of Israel had to come to Jerusalem three times a year, once in the spring for Passover. And there they celebrated the reality that they had had freedom from the power of Pharaoh and the bondage in Egypt. They celebrated that for a week. Then later on in the spring, just before the summer, they would celebrate the Feast of Pentecost, where they would celebrate the receiving of God's word at Mount Sinai, that they had God's law, and because of that, they could be God's people. And then at the end of the harvest, at the end of the summer, they would celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, and they would remember God has given us a place, a home, a land to be in. We're not wandering the earth and we don't live in a country that's not our own, but we have our own place. And every time they would come to Jerusalem, they would remember that these were joyful, life-altering moments in the identity of the nation of Israel. So God wanted to make sure that they were joyfully remembered. And so he commanded them to have a party. I command you to come together and feast for a week because I want you to be excited about what I have done in your life. All the more reason that our worship should be just as filled with excitement and joy as we gather together because we want to remember the life-altering moments that have happened in our lives, the joy, the things that have changed our identity and remind us of who we are as Christ followers. So we come and we gather together and we sing because we have a God who's worthy of praise. We celebrate communion because we have the reality that our sins have been forgiven, not because we offered up a goat or a lamb, but because Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and rose from the grave. We celebrate the ordinance of baptism or a brother or sister who has come to believe in Jesus. We celebrate the fact that they are one of us as a brother or sister in Christ. And even when the offering plate comes by in a little while, it's not because the church is greedy for money. We're celebrating the fact that God has given us everything we need for life and godliness, and he makes it possible for us to live life the way he designed for it to be lived. When our worship celebrates God's provision, when we are excited about who he is and what he's done in our lives, our hearts learn to be glad, not because our life is good, but because God is good. And whenever we're glad about who God is and what he's done for us, it tunes our hearts to remember the future. Uh, Not too long ago, uh, I had the opportunity to take my kids to Disney World. We made pilgrimage. Uh, We were very excited because we pulled our kids out of school and the day we took them, anytime we do anything fun for our kids, we always make it a surprise. We never tell them where we're going. And so uh, we woke them out of their beds and we drove them up to school and we slowed down and then we just kept on driving. (laughs) And my kids were just like, "Uh, Dad, what What are we doing? And I said, oh, I don't know. I thought we'd go on an adventure today. Really? Really? Yeah, let's go. Let's go have some fun. Let's, let's take a day off of school. And so about five minutes later, they just can't take it anymore. Dad, where are we going? You know, I have a, I have a five-year-old, an eight-year-old, an 11-year-old, and they can only go so long with no, not knowing what's coming next. And so uh, I would say, hey, guys, do you trust me? And my 11-year-old goes, Dad. Because every time it's a surprise, I always say, hey, do you trust me? Because I want them to learn that basically anytime I don't tell them where they're going, it's usually like we're taking them to Dairy Queen or Brahms or in this case, Disney World. Like it's always a good thing. If you'll just trust me, I will lead you to something that's good. We're far more likely to follow Christ into the uncertainty of tomorrow when we have regularly celebrated our faith, his faithfulness to us in the past. That's what I mean when I say, remember the future. Because when we remember what Christ has done for us in the past, it helps us to celebrate his faithfulness to us even though it hasn't happened yet. And if you think about it, Jesus Christ has died on the cross for our sins. He's risen from the grave while we were still sinners. He did those things for us. If he has taken care of the bigger issue of my salvation, surely he will take care of of the lesser thing of whatever's gonna go on in my life tomorrow. If he's provided for me in the past and I celebrate that, that helps me to walk into the future with confidence 
Oh yeah, God, you're good to me. I forgot. I wanted to control things. Thank you for reminding me. Friends, our worship must be filled with excitement about who God is and what God has done or else our hearts are just gonna go out of tune. I mean it. I really mean it. I mean, which would you want your heart to be more excited about? Getting tickets for the Big 12 championship game yesterday and gathering together with a bunch of fans to sing on a team or gathering together for worship this morning. Now I'm firing shots, I'm sorry, I'm preaching. They give me once a year to do this, so I'm gonna fire my shots. But like, I want us to be excited about gathering together, not because our lives are in good shape, but because we have the risen Lord Jesus, and we get to praise him every week, and that tunes our hearts to sing about his grace to us. Celebration is a great tuning fork for our hearts. But as we keep reading here in the Psalms, only through verse one, we better get going here. When we draw near to God, it tunes our hearts as well. That's the second blank. If we draw near to God, it tunes our hearts. Look, look a little bit. He says, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing in your gates, O Jerusalem. In those days, Jerusalem was known as the house of the Lord because that's where God's temple was located. And God had told the nation of Israel that wherever his temple was located is where his presence would dwell, his, his, uh, his localized presence on the earth. And so um, the, it made Jerusalem a very special place for the Jews as they would come up to celebrate these feasts. It was a sacred place, an exciting place. You couldn't just offer a sacrifice to God in your backyard. You, could, you couldn't just go to the town square in Galilee and go, hey, let's do a sin offering for our town. The only place you could make offerings, sacrificial offerings to the Lord was at the temple in Jerusalem. It was, you couldn't do worship far away. It had to be close, close up. And as they came to Jerusalem, They were drawing nearer and nearer to God, and as they drew nearer and nearer to God, they were also drawing nearer and nearer to each other. That's why it says in verse three that Jerusalem is built as a city that is bound firmly together, which the tribes go up. Jerusalem was a city designed to get a lot of people in a really compact place, in this case, for worship. Drawing near to God tunes our hearts because proximity always reminds us of who we are. Uh, Just a few weeks ago, I got a strange, unexpected email from my old high school football coach. I grew up in Plano, Texas, on the north side of Dallas, and I was on a a member of the Plano Wildcat football team, and we won our last state championship in 1994. So back in 94, (laughs) I got to play on that team, and that's the last state championship that high school has seen. And so my coach sends us email and says, Lance, get over here. It's been 25 years since that state championship. Whoa, that's a long time. We're going to do a thing at the beginning of the game, the coin toss. You guys are going to come out and do this great thing. It'll be fun. I was like, okay. So I come on out and I see these guys, about 20 of us show up. And these guys I haven't seen in 20 years. But as soon as I walk in that locker room and I walk down the tunnel and I got out on the field, it was like, whoa. I'm 17 again. Like all the memories just came flooding back. The sights and the smells and the sounds. And I, I, could, I mean, I realized as a, you know, 40 plus year old man, I looked back and I said, I was looking back at my 17 year old self and going, man, I became a man here. I learned a lot of really important things about who I am. I mean, I became a Christian as a result of a lot of my sports experiences. And it just rushed back all over me. And it was no different for the nation of Israel as they came up and they got into Jerusalem. They got into the gates and then they got to the temple and then they went up on the temple. The sights, the sounds, the smells. I mean, at Passover, they're sacrificing who knows how many lambs. It was a, it smelled like all these things would come back reminding them of who they are. It was centering, grounding, reinforcing And I'm hoping that when you come into this place, into this room and sing the songs and hear the word, it has the same effect on your heart. But we also have to acknowledge that the reverse is also true with proximity. When God is out of sight, when God is out of mind, when God is far away, that's when we're most prone to wander. 
The world that we live in is constantly trying to tune us to its pitch. And our own sinfulness leads us towards doing things our way instead of God's way. And we make some pretty funky notes in those moments when we've wandered away from the Lord. And in, and in those moments in our weaknesses and in those moments in our sin, God's not off standing to the side going, when are you gonna get back over here? Hurry up. That's not the way he relates to us. He's not waiting for us to come groveling back to him. In fact, it's quite the opposite. God has always been drawing near to us first. I mean, think about the entire story of the Bible. When you go back to the garden of Adam and Eve, God was walking with them in the cool of the day. His house was with Adam and Eve, but we chose to be distant from him. And so we were cast out of the garden and we were wandering essentially as a, as a race. We were kind of homeless, distant from God, separate from him. And was that okay with the Lord? No. He said, I want to be close to you. So he told Moses, I want you to build a tabernacle for me and I'm going to travel with you wherever you go as you wander until I bring you into your home. And so they built the tabernacle. But can God dwell with his people in a tent? Well, no. So he brings them into the promised land and establishes them as a nation and says, go ahead, let's build a temple and this can be the place of worship, ground zero for where God can be God and his people can be his people and they can minister to the nations around them. But because of the disobedience of Israel and their unwillingness to follow the Lord, that temple was destroyed twice. And so God said, okay, well, fine. I will come and dwell with them myself. And he pursues us even further. He comes to Mary and says, beloved, you will bear a son and his name will be Jesus, God with us, and he will be the savior of mankind. And so Jesus comes and lives among us and shows us life the way it was meant to be lived. And we played some funky notes again and we crucified him. But praise God, he rose from the grave, ascended into heaven. He's now seated at the right hand of God the Father. And we're distant from him. But he's given us his spirit that indwells us. So now that when we come together, the spirit of God that indwells each of us now builds us into a holy house, a temple for the Lord. But there's still sin. There's still pain. There's still suffering and difficulty. And so we wait for Revelation 21 when it says, the dwelling of God is with man once again and we'll be face to face with him and he'll wipe away the tears from our eyes and death and crying shall be no more because where he is, there we will be also. God has always been pursuing you, always even when you're playing those funky notes, even when you feel distant from him, God has been running after you. And so my question for you this morning is, are you feeling distant? Do you feel far from the Lord? If you want your heart to be back in tune with him again, then come back. Because you can't tune your heart to his from far away. You have to let him get close to you and you have to draw near to him. Our hearts will always go out of tune if we don't stay up close with God, but they will also go out of tune if we stop giving him thanks. And that's the third way that worship tunes our hearts this morning. The third way that worship tunes our hearts, when we give God credit, when we give God credit, it tunes our hearts. Look at verses four and five. They show us that the purpose of these annual gatherings as the nation came up to Jerusalem was to give thanks to the name of the Lord, as well as to hear judgments or um, teaching from their Davidic king. So it says that they came to give praise or give thanks to the name of the Lord their God. The entire nation came to give thanks to him. The word there literally means to throw praise at him. God, you brought us out of slavery from Egypt. You're amazing. God, you have given us your word and show us how to live life. Thank you. 
God, you've given us a land that we can be in. We love you. They would just take their praises and throw them at God. But it's not as if God was waiting to be thanked. It's not as if God needed it either. God required those feasts and those festivals, and he required the thanksgiving because we need it. Thanksgiving tunes our hearts because it reminds us to be humble. Christmas is a few weeks away, right? You guys remember when you were kids and you had those like one or two big ticket items on your Christmas list? And then you're like, you know, you're 10 years old and you get, you get the big ticket item and you're opening it and you're hoping, you're hoping and it, it is, I have it, it's mine. This maniacal laughter starts to well up inside you because you want to run down to your best friend's house and say, see, I got it, I got it, it's mine. And then your mom just kind of sitting there by the hearth and the fire and the Christmas carols in the background, she goes, um, sweetie. Don't forget to write down your aunt's name on your, on your list so you can send her a thank you note. Oh, mom, don't steal my Christmas glory right now and remind me that I wouldn't have what I have were it not for the amazing generosity of my aunt. Okay, okay, you're right, you're right. When we don't give God credit for what he's done and is doing in our lives, we'll begin to think that we're the ones that kind of made those things happen. I mean, we are working pretty hard lately. I mean, I, I, I do look good. I'm feeling a little trim right now. I mean, I got people, you know, they think I'm really smart. You know, I'm, I'm, I, got, I really solved that problem at work and my boss was really impressed with me. So yeah, I mean, I deserve that bonus, sure. God, God warned the Israelites of this same problem if you have some time later today, Deuteronomy chapter 8 is a really good read because there God says, hey, I'm about to bring you into the promised land, but before you go, here's what I want you to know. You're going to go in and you're going to have vineyards you didn't plant, houses you didn't build, and fields you didn't sow. And you're going to walk in and say, wow, I have done a really good job with this thing. I, my great power and, you know, just... Hard work ethic brought me this wealth. And he says, beware. Because at that moment, you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. When we give God credit, we acknowledge that he is the one from whom all blessings flow. It redirects our hearts. It tunes our hearts to admire and be devoted to him. And it forces our pride to remember that we are simply his creatures and we are not the creator. It reminds our hearts that we're needy, that we're dependent, and that's certainly not the tune that the world out there is tuning our hearts to be. When our hearts are humble before God, it makes our worship possible. I mean, let's admit it, sometimes we come to church and our worship kind of feels like our mom making us write a thank you note on Christmas Day after we got the toy, we're like, Dear Lord, thank you for everything you've given me, whatever. If it's just routine, chances are there's a lack of gratitude somewhere in your heart, a lack of thankfulness. But when we're humble before God, our worship is no longer lip service. It's not just a ritual. It's genuine. It's reverent. It's heartfelt. How long has it been since your worship was heartfelt, genuine, reverent. Our pride is sneaky. Unless we make a regular practice of giving thanks to God, our hearts will wander out of tune. Fourth, and finally this morning, when we want what God wants, that's what tunes our hearts. When we pray for God's best, when we pray for God's best, it tunes our hearts. The psalm concludes with four verses of exhortation by the psalmist for everyone to pray for the peace and prosperity of Jerusalem, for those who love her, for their neighbors and their friends. It's a lot of verses in a psalm to talk about the necessity of prayer. So that's where I want us to end this morning. Now, we can certainly pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Lord knows 
It's been a hotbed of conflict and violence for 3,000 years. We can certainly do that. But when we think about what this text is really talking about, we realize that Jerusalem cannot and will not know peace until she receives her Prince of Peace, the Messiah. Israeli and Palestinian alike, peace is not possible without the person of Jesus Christ. And that's what I want us to look at this morning, this word peace, because the psalmist says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. The Hebrew word there is the word shalom. It's one of the most beautiful words in the entire Hebrew language. And it doesn't just mean the absence of war. It doesn't just mean the absence of conflict. Shalom refers to a condition where everything can flourish. It means completeness, wholeness, prosperity, well-being. Shalom is essentially the condition of enjoying God's best, life the way he intended for it to be lived. And what's interesting here is that there's a little bit of a play on words with the command. It says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And if you don't know this, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, means city of peace. It's the same word. It's the same word. So as they're approaching the city for the festival, what are they asking God for? They're asking God for the city of Shalom to be and remain a city of Shalom. Why? Because the peace of the nation was directly tied to the peace of God's city, of God's house, Jerusalem. The people wanted peace, and God wanted peace. So here we have a great example of God's people asking God not just for what they wanted, but also what God wanted as well. God wants everyone to have peace that he has to offer. Prayer tunes our hearts because prayer aligns our hearts, aligns our wants with God's. Have you guys ever read one of the Psalms uh, of Lament where the Psalm begins with a psalmist saying, Lord, my life is terrible. Why have you done this to me? Why don't you help me? Why am I suffering here? But by the end of the Psalm, the same psalmist is saying, Lord, I trust you. You are worthy to be praised. You are high and lifted up. How is that possible? It's amazing and fascinating to me that prayer is one of those things that can actually tune our hearts while we are praying. Have you ever done that? Just like the psalmist, you started out your prayer praying for one thing, then halfway through you find yourself praying for something else, something better, That's why prayer is so transformative because when we're praying, we're realizing a few really important things. Number one, even though we're not God, but even though we're not God, we're his, okay? And if I'm his, then he's gonna take care of what is his. He's gonna take care of his own. And if he's gonna take care of his own, then I want whatever he wants, because he knows what's best. I would rather his will be done than mine, because he will bring about what is best, not just for me, but for his entire kingdom. You see, when we want what God wants, we embody his best, not just for ourselves, but to the entire world. When we want God, what God wants, we're no longer focused on ourselves. We're more like him. Our hearts are like his. We regard other people as more important than ourselves. We lay down our lives for their good. Verse eight says, for my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. The word companions means neighbors. When our prayers line up with God's desires, it's not just us who benefits. Everyone does. So let's ask God to give his best to the people in your life. And let's ask him how he might give his best through you, to your family, to your friends, to your neighbors. And I promise, 
that will keep your heart in tune with his. When we gather together for worship, friends, it tunes our hearts to God because we live in a world that wants to tune our hearts away from him. So just like the psalm ends, he says pray and pray for peace. So that's how I'd like to end this morning. I'd like to bow our heads and our hearts and let's talk to the Lord for a second about where they're tuned and how we can be a blessing of peace to the people that we're around. Will you bow your heads and let's pray together.